Okay, I'm going to start a new series. Now, many of you are somewhat familiar, but I looked at it was several years since I've taught this, and I've taught maybe little sections of it spotty throughout. But I'm finally going to finish writing my book on the Song of Songs and Solomon. And so I'm going to, it helps me when I'm writing the book if I'm teaching on it as well. And so what we're going to present right now is dun, 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 Solomon, the epitome of a human king and the biggest failure. That's what he was. Now, let's take a minute and look at the historical background. And the reason why I'm doing this now is because I believe the Antichrist is going to be just like Solomon. Solomon is a type of Antichrist. And I know that may come as a shock to many, but by the time we're done, you're going to see it so clearly. And to understand the Song of Songs, you have to understand who Solomon was. So we, it's always good to start at the beginning. Let's look at what Moses, God told Moses, 400 years before Solomon. In Deuteronomy 17, 14, it says, When you've come into the land which the Lord your God will do what? Man, how many of you would like an acre of land given to you? How about 10,000 acres, a whole nation? Wow, given. It says, and you say, I want a king over me, like all the nations that are around me. How many know God knew in advance what would happen 400 years later? This is how you know there has to be a God, because only he can say things and make sure it happens 2,000 years later. So God knew now that God did not want them to have a king, but he says, I know you humans, I made you. And I know 400 years from now, you're going to want a king. So look at verse 18. It says, when that king is sitting on the throne of his kingdom, he has to write himself a copy of this Torah in a book. There were no printing presses. Everything had to be done by hand. It would take over a year for a scribe to write the whole Torah. But things that people don't catch. It says, he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priest. So the priest had the actual Torah scroll. And then the king has to write himself a copy of it. And the priest would watch over to make sure he didn't miss a jot or a tittle. Okay, but if you were the king, you would say, okay, Joe, you go write it for me. But God says, no, no, you can't hire someone or order someone as the king to have them write it. You have to write every single letter, every single word. Why would that be? And if they know it, they're accountable. I don't know that. No, they're accountable. Now, it goes on to say that he also has to carry it with him everywhere he goes. How many of us know that every house in America probably has six Bibles in it and they never open it? It's just sitting on the table or on the shelf. They got their big family Bible and it's never been opened. It looks all brand new, sitting there 40 years later. Well, this says he has to not only carry it, he has to read, read it. Every day of his life, he has to be reading. Well, if Christians like to say, well, we're kings and priests, well, guess what? You better carry your Bible with you and read it every day. And then it says, the purpose is that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this Torah and these statutes, to do them. How many of you know, I'm surely no politicians here think they're greater than the rest of us peons, do they? Do you know any politicians that, hello, well, the king would obviously think he's above the law like so many politicians do today. Well, he has to realize he has a boss that he's got to report to. And look at this. This is what I have in bold in your notes. The whole purpose is so his heart is not lifted up above everybody else. 
He's no better than everybody else. He's been given power and authority, but it's to rule well. And it's so that he doesn't turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left, to the end that he may do what? Have a long life. Okay, he and his children in the midst of Israel. But now look at Ezekiel chapter 28, 1 through 5. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyrus. Now tell me who you think this prince of Tyrus symbolically represents. Thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up. And you said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man and not God. Though you set your heart as the heart of God, behold, you are wiser than Daniel. Wow, there's no secret they can hide from you. But look what happened. With your wisdom and with your understanding, you've gotten yourself riches. You've gotten gold and silver into your treasures. And by your great wisdom and by your traffic, have you increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. So here we have someone who's very extremely wise. They've got lots of riches due to their wisdom, and it causes their heart to be lifted up. We can see that's not a good thing, right? All right, as we see this unfold, when did God become Israel's king? When did God become Israel's king? When Israel became a nation in the Exodus. Okay, Exodus 19 at Shavuot or Pentecost, God enters a covenant with them. Do you know in Genesis, he's not called the king, he's called the great shepherd. He was always a shepherd, God is always a shepherd, and then he is a king. Solomon was never a shepherd. But with that said, God was upset because they didn't want him as a king anymore. And when did they reject him as king? What time of year? On the anniversary of their wedding at Shavuot. Here God became their king at Pentecost, and it was on Pentecost they rejected him as their king. They wanted a king like all the nations. So God was not happy. Let's look at 1 Samuel 8, 7-21. The Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people and all that they say to you. He said, Samuel, they've not rejected you. They have rejected me that I should not reign over them. According to all the works they've done since the day I brought them out of Egypt, even until this day, works with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, they're also doing to you. And so then God says, Samuel, listen to their voice. But if, if someone rejected you, the first reaction is, fine, get out of here. But God says, oh, Samuel, warn them. Tell them how horrible it will be if they have a human king. And so that's what he does. Look at this. He says, surely protest solemnly to them and show them the kind of king who is going to reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked for a king. And he said, this is what the king is going to do. He's going to take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, his horsemen, and they will run before his chariots. He will appoint commanders over thousands and fifties. Some do plow his ground and reap his harvest and make his weapons of war and weapons for his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take your fields, your vineyards, your olive yards, even the best, and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give it to his eunuchs and to his servants. In other words, he's going to tax you. It's a government. And these humans are going to take everything from you and it becomes theirs. He'll take your male slaves, your slave girls, and your finest young men and your asses and put them to work. 
He'll take the tenth of your sheep. You'll be his servants. And then he says, you're going to cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourself. And the Lord's not going to answer you in that day. But guess what? It says the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, we will have a king over us. And we shall be also we like all the nations so that our king may judge us to go out before us and fight our battles. So Samuel heard all the words of the people and repeated them in the ears of the Lord. Okay, so it's all his servants and, you know, everything becomes the kings. Now, who was the first king in Israel? Saul. Okay, Saul was king. Uh, then... A little bit later, David is also king. Do we hear about Saul or David doing any of those things that we just read? No, it's not there. So let's look at Hosea 3, very important verse, or 13. Hosea 13, 9 through 11. He says, O Israel, you have destroyed yourself, but in me is your help. I will be your king. I will be your king. Where is any other that can save you in all of your cities and your judges of whom you said, give me a king and princes. And look what God says. I gave you a king in my anger and I took him away in my wrath. Why? Because God wanted to be their king. So what happens, Israel says, we don't want God. We want a human king. Now, I want to start here, too. In 2 Samuel 12, 24 and 25, David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went into her and laid with her. She bore a son and called his name, what? Solomon. And what does it say? The Lord loved him. This is what is so sad. The Lord truly loved Solomon, and he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, and he called his name Yedida, which means a friend of God or the beloved of God. So Solomon was known as the beloved of the Lord. Now look at 1 Chronicles 29.1. David's about to die. And he says, uh, furthermore, David the king said to everybody, Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen is what? Young, tender, and the work to build the temple is great, for the palace isn't for man, but for the Lord God. As a matter of fact, at 1 Kings 3, 7, look what Solomon says. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I don't know how to go out or how to go in. So we see Solomon started out good. Beloved of the Lord. And then, look what... God does for Solomon. We're going to look at 1 Kings 3, 13 and 14. God is saying to Solomon, and I have also given you that which you have not asked. Look what God gave him. Riches, honor, so that there will not be any among the kings of the whole earth like to you all your days. If you walk in my ways, keep my statutes, my chukot, my commandments, as your father David did walk, then I will also lengthen your days. Well, what else did he get? It says God gave him that. Look at 1 Kings 4, 29 through 31. God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceedingly much. He even gave him largeness of heart even as the sand that is on the seashore. Here it is. Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the East Country, all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone on earth, wiser than Ethan and Heman and Koko, the Darda, the sons of Maho. And then it says his fame was in all nations. Wow. He also became the white. God gave him phenomenal wisdom. And he made him world famous, but God's the one who gave it. Look at 1 Kings 4, 34. There came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings of the earth, which had heard of his wisdom. 
Okay, we know from, this is in your notes, you can add it. But in Luke 12, 48, it says, unto whom so ever much is what? Given of him shall be much required. What did God, uh, Solomon did not earn any of these. God just gave it to him. He gave him wealth, great wealth. He gave him honor. God gave him a long life. He gave him wisdom. He gave him fame. He gave him power. Now, many of us, man, just give me one of those. You know, I'd be happy if I just had money. Or I'd be happy if I was just famous, right? But Solomon, what more could be added? What, what more could God give him? He also had over a thousand concubines and a bunch of wives. And here's Solomon. He's the, acts like a baby. Total likely like a baby. Now, let's watch this. Remember what we just read. Let me, let me go back here a minute. Okay, yeah, right here. He's going to take your sons and appoint them for himself and his chariots and his horsemen and his harvest and his weapons and his and his and his. Well, look at this. 1 Kings 9, 22. But Solomon did not make any slave out of the sons of Israel, but the sons of Israel were men of war and his servants and his rulers and his commanders, rulers of his chariots and his horsemen. These were the chief of the officers who were over God's work. Solomon's work. He wasn't doing this for God. He was using everything that God had given him to advance himself. What, what do you think the people thought of Solomon's rule? Does anybody know what? I mean, when you, you want to know if it's a good king or a bad king, you ask the generation who lived under the king. Do you think the people under Solomon thought he was fantastic? Let's look at what the Bible says. Uh, if you remember, Solomon dies. His son, Rehoboam, is now has a competitor called Jeroboam. All right. And let's look what this says. 1 Kings 12, 9 through 11, he said to them, Rehoboam, what advice do you give that we may answer this people who have spoken to us, saying, please lighten the yoke which your father put on us. So here, the people say Solomon was the big burden. There's this big yoke Solomon has put on us. So that tells you one thing. And it says the young men who had grown up with Rehoboam spoke to him and said, hey, speak to this people who spoke to you saying, your father made our yoke heavy. So we already know all the citizens thought Solomon put a heavy yoke on them, but you make it lighter for us. This is what you should say to them. My little finger will be thicker than my father's loins. And now my father loaded you with the heavy yoke. I'm going to add to your yoke. Solomon whipped you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Okay, so wow. They're saying Solomon was absolutely horrible, and his Solomon's own son admitted that Solomon had whipped him with whips. And that they loaded the people with a heavy yoke. Now, why is it called Solomon's temple? He built it. <laughs> he didn't really. How many of you have ever been at a business where you did all the work and the boss got all the credit and never gave you any credit for all your work? You know what I'm talking about? Solomon didn't lift his finger a bit. Let's begin with the pattern. To build everything? Look at what this says. First Chronicles 28, 11 through 19. David gave to Solomon the pattern of the porch, of the houses, the treasuries, the upper rooms, the innermost rooms, the place of the mercy seat, the pattern of all that David had by the spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord and all the rooms around the treasuries. Okay, David is the one who got the pattern and he gave it 
to Solomon. And then look at the last uh, line there, that section underlined. It says, everything was in writing from the hand of the Lord. David says, he made me understand all the work of the pattern. So David is the one who got the pattern from the Lord. David is the one who also gave Solomon the pattern. Now look at 1 Chronicles 29. Look what David says to the congregation. Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen, is young and tender. The work is great. And then it says, the palace is not for man before the Lord. And look what David says. I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God. I prepared the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, the wood, the onyx stones in abundance. So David provided all these things in abundance. And then he says, because I've delighted in the house of my God, out of my own treasure of gold and silver, I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. And he mentions all of these things. And then the next underline, the chiefs of the fathers and the rulers of the tribes of Israel and the commanders of thousands and hundreds with rulers of the king's work, they offered how? Okay, this is a volunteer thing, just like with Moses' tabernacle when they had to say, stop, stop giving. Everybody is giving into this. And look at this. Look what people gave for the house of God. 5,000 talents of gold, 10,000 derricks, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, 100,000 talents of iron. And he who had precious stones gave to the treasury of the house of the Lord by the hand of Jehiel the Gershonite. Okay, people are flooding with all of this, everything that's needed. And look what David, look at the difference between David and Solomon. Listen to what David says in verse 16. Oh Lord, our God, all of this store that we have prepared to build you a house for your holy name, it all comes from your hand. It's all your own. None of this is us giving what we have. Everything we have belongs to you anyway. You see the attitude. Look at verse 19. He says, give to Solomon, my son, a perfect heart to keep your commandments, your testimonies, your statutes, and to do all these things and to build the magnificent house for which I have made ready. David's got everything ready. Okay. Now, typically, everyone is motivated. Everybody says, let's do it. Let's do it. And then what happens if things get put off and put off and put off? What happens to the people's motivation? Well, look at 1 Kings 6, 1. And it happened in the 480th year after the sons of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt. In the fourth year of Solomon's reign, in the month of Ziph, which is the second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. He waited four years to build the house of the Lord. Everything was made ready. Everyone's excited. Let's go. And Solomon waited four years to even begin it. As a matter of fact, in 1 Kings 6, 37 and 38, in the fourth year, in the month of Ziph, the foundation, he waited four years to just even lay the foundation. And then in the 11th year, in the month of Bull or Heshbon, which is the eighth month, the house was finished as to all its parts and as to all its plants. So he was seven years in building it. He waited four years, even though everyone was voluntarily giving everything, they were all excited to build the temple of the house. Solomon, first thing he does is say, oh, let's just wait. And they had to wait four years before they could even get started. Why do you think it took him so long to get started? Well, let's look at what the Bible says. In 1 Kings 7, 1, Solomon was 13 years building his own house. Uh, oh my goodness, that's got to take some time. And then look at 7, 8. Solomon also had a build a house for Pharaoh's daughter who he wasn't supposed to marry. God says, don't marry. Don't go back to Egypt for no reason. But he had to build a house for her. That had to take some time. Now, listen to Psalms 127.1. This is David who has written a letter to his son Solomon. Look at this. It's for Solomon. And he says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Okay. He's saying, Solomon, unless the Lord builds his own house, you will labor in vain 
You following me? Okay, well, let's look. Okay, I have it here. This is the dedication of the temple. Solomon is, they finally got it done. They're celebrating, and Solomon wants to go and pray before God. And how do you know if someone's really a narcissist or really into themselves? What do they talk about? I, me, my. Okay, and not only that, they don't want to give any credit to anybody else. I'll show you verses next week where Solomon had like 600,000 workers from Lebanon and 700,000 workers from Israel. And they're all working to build the house, right? It's not a one-man affair. Well, let's look at his prayer. 1 Kings 8, 13. I have surely built you a house to dwell in. Look at verse 20. The Lord has performed his word that he spake, and I am risen up in the room of David, my father, and I sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised, and I have built a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. Look at verse 44. If your people go out to battle against their enemy, wherever soever they shall send them, and shall pray to the Lord toward the city which you have chosen, and toward the house which I have built for your name. Verse 48. And so return unto you with all their heart, with all their soul in the land of their enemies, which led them away captive. Pray unto you toward their land, which you gave to their fathers and the city, which you have chosen. And of course, the house, which I have built for your name. Now, okay. Unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. Who built it? Who took the credit for building it? Solomon. Look at Ecclesiastes 2.11 that Solomon wrote at the end of his life. I look on all the works that my hands have done and on the labor that I had labored to do and all is vanity and vexation of spirit and there's no profit under the sun. Why is all vanity? Because he took all the credit. And what did David say? Unless the Lord build a house, they labor in vain. And here he's realizing he's laboring in vain. But it gets worse. I want to go back to this. Oh, I went the wrong way. Let me go here. Okay. God gave him all of that. All of that. And look what he says in Ecclesiastes 2, 17 and 19. Therefore, I hated life because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous to me. All is vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor. He hated building the temple because I have to leave it to the men that's after me, all of my wealth and all of my goods and all of my houses. I hate life because I've got to leave it to somebody else. And who knows whether he'll be wise or a fool. Yet he's going to have rule over all my labor, wherein I labored and wherein I have showed myself to be so wise. This is also vanity. Talk about the ultimate narcissist. He had everything given to him, and he's a whiny, whiny, because he might have to give it to somebody else. That's not fair. Does this give you a new light a little bit on Solomon? Oh, you haven't seen anything yet. Wait till next week. But I'm going to go through and tie the New Testament that talks about Solomon as well as the Old Testament. And we're going to link them all together. And you're going to find out what a big whiny baby Solomon actually was. And then we're going to teach the Song of Songs so you better understand. And I can tell you right now, no one has ever taught the Song of Songs like I do. And it's not like what you think. It has nothing to do with what you think. I will give you a, a little hint. Did God want Israel to have a king? No. Who was supposedly the best human king that could be given to them was Solomon. And in the Song of Songs, the bride is in the king's chamber. She knows who the king is. She knows what the king does. But what does she do? It, it's like the kid's cartoon where the lady is in the castle and she's looking out the tower and she's trying to escape because she's been trapped. And she sees a shepherd 
And she says, uh, tell me who I love so much, where you feed your flock and where do you make it rest at noon? Well, now, wait a minute. Solomon was never a shepherd. She knows the king, but she's following a shepherd and God was their shepherd before anything else. So the Song of Songs is about God wooing Israel and humanity away from a human king back to him as their shepherd king who loves them and cares for them. And think about it. What does she say? Oh, I love you, but where do you work? Uh, oh, oh, and by the way, when do you make your flock rest at noon? Because I don't want to work with you. I just want to come at lunch and I want to visit and have you just love me, love me, love me, love me. She's not concerned about him. She doesn't know anything about him. But oh my goodness, she professes love. And so what you're going to see all through the Song of Songs, what this is about and how it's very prophetic. The book of Song of Songs is prophetic about today. It's about the maturation or the maturity of the bride, where the bride is totally self-centered. She doesn't want to work the harvest. And then after a while, she ends up wanting to work the harvest. She gets up early and she works with the shepherd. So that is really what the Song of Songs is about. Continually through it, she goes to sleep. And how many of us know the church is always going to sleep? Uh, and there are some horrible mistranslations in that book that makes all the difference in the world. Uh, so we'll, we'll go through all that. So get ready. Hold on. Buckle up. We're going to have the funnest time over the next couple of months as I go through Solomon and the, and the songs. And you'll see how prophetic it is for today. Amen. Let's stand. Amen. <clears throat>